Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I want you to say, I am a doer of the word of God. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I want you to understand that it's not just the radio program listeners. It's not the radio program listeners that get results. It's the doers who get results. It's not the CD players who get results. Who is it? It's the doers who get results. Do you realize it's not the church attenders that get results? It is who? The doers who get results. You know, it's not the conference attendees that get results. Who is it? It's the doers who get results. And you know, there's a lot of Christians that go to church. There are people who go conference to conference. There are people who have the radio on all day long listening to preachers. There are people who collect teaching CDs. And you know that there are quite a few of those that listen to message after message, but they haven't actually done it yet. And they're not getting results just because they have 20 CD sets on their shelf or because they listen. They went to five conferences this year. That's not where how you get results. You get results by being a. A doer of the word of God. And let me remind you of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And verses 24 to 27. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. Is that all you have to do is hear the word? A lot of people put a period right there and say, that's the person who's a wise man. That's not where Jesus stopped. He said, who hears these words of mine? And then he says, and, and what? Puts them into practice or does them, does them. Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. I'm going to stop a minute and and just point out something. This parable, and if you've been in the church very long, you've heard this parable before. I remember even like in children's church, I don't remember the song very well, but there was a song about building your house on the rock and you and kids act it out and, and act like they're building a house. And there was this idea, it kind of was just a general assumed idea that because I'm a Christian, I'm in Sunday school and I'm in church, I'm a wise man. But they missed the point. It's not being in church that makes you a wise man. And then if you ask the question, well, what is the rock? A, what is the rock if you build your house on the rock? Well, that's the, Jesus is the answer that most everybody gives. And you know that's not exactly right. And actually, um, in an indirect way, you could say it is. Because in, in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and Jesus is the word. But actually, she said the word, and, and that's close, but actually his application is doing the word. Doing the word is building on the rock. And so it is a wrong idea to think that because I'm in church on Sunday, I'm the wise man. That's not true. Because in that idea and assumption, then who is the foolish man? Well, those are the people out there that are not in church. That kind of follows, right? But do you know that's not even what he said? It's not the wicked. It's not the people out on the street who are the foolish ones. He said, they hear my word. Well, guess what? Sinners are not hearing the word. 
Sinners don't listen to the preaching. The wicked aren't listening to any preaching. They're not listening to the radio programs and the CDs. So this is not a comparison between Christians and sinners. This is a comparison between Christians and Christians. Two groups in church on Sunday. Two groups that turn on the radio and listen to teaching on radio. Two groups of Christians that attend faith conferences. Two groups of Christians that have CDs, preaching CDs that they listen to. And the one group is going to do it. And the other group is going to say, yes, amen, preacher, good message. Go out and not do it. Right. <laughs> Amen. And so those are the ones that are the Christians who are not doing the word. They get confused because they think I'm in church all the time. Why don't I get results? And they get disappointed. They get disillusioned. And I'm wanting to, uh, you know, on the radio program, actually, I've been for five months teaching why some people don't get healed and going through reason after reason after reason after reason and spending a lot of time on each one. But I'm going to look at that a little bit tonight in another light because Christians get disappointed and think, why am I not getting results? Well, here is one thing we need to check up on. Are you doing what you're hearing. And with that comes the word diligence. Diligent to put it in practice. Because you can say, yes, amen, good word. I'm encouraged by that. That makes me feel good. But if you don't go out of here and do it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then you've heard it and it's gone in one ear and out the other and you're not going to get results until you do it. And so we always need to check up on, am I doing it? Am I being diligent? Am I putting it into practice? Am I applying it? Because we need to look at this parable and see it is not between Christians and sinners comparison. It's a Christian and Christian comparison. Those who are hearing the word and putting in practice, they're going to get the results. But those who hear the word and say, yes, amen, good message. I like that pastor and go out and then forget about it the rest of the week. And they don't put it in practice and then they're not going to get results. It's just not going to happen because you have to do the word. And so tonight the Lord gave me this title. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Meaning. This came to me because of, again, talking to someone and this person shared because of teaching. They have even recently learned the revelation that Jesus paid for our healing by his stripes. We are healed and that our healing is included in our redemption. And so that legally it belongs to us. And this person was so excited. Yay. Okay, I get it. I understand it now. I'm healed. And so then I heard them telling all their friends, yes, I'm healed. And I'm just waiting for the manifestation. And they talked to me on the phone for about 20 minutes. And in that conversation, I heard them say it more than once. I'm waiting for the manifestation. I'm waiting for the manifestation. I'm waiting for the manifestation. Well, let's go back to the two kinds of faith. And I taught that message a a little while back. It's on CD, Faith 101, Two Kinds of Faith. I also have it on my YouTube channel, uh, post it up. But there are two kinds of faith. There is natural human faith, and there is the God kind of faith. Okay, faith, let's back up. Faith means believing. Faith means believing. Well, every human being believes Something believes different things. Everybody believes things. Now, natural human faith believes what you see. That's why it's a common saying. Seeing is what? Believing. Believing. If you see it, they believe it. And so seeing is believing. Well, that's totally natural kind of faith. And you have faith in that chair right now because you're sitting in it. 
if you didn't have faith in it, you wouldn't have sat. Right? If you looked at that chair and it had only three legs, would you sit? No, because you'd think that chair is not safe. Everybody can do that. Even the sinner going to hell can do that. And that sinner going to hell can say, seeing is believing. You show it to me and then I'll believe it. That's natural faith. Everybody does it. Everybody can do it. Well, then the God kind of faith is believing what you don't see. Before you see it, you believe not only that it's coming, but you believe it's done. The God kind of faith is based on God's word. Meaning you cannot have the God kind of faith unless you have God's word. Because you cannot believe something That, you know, and use the God kind of faith for it unless God said it, right? You can't believe that you're going to go to Mars unless God said you're going to Mars, right? So you got to have a word from God. So the God kind of faith begins with a word from God. The God kind of faith begins with the word from God. It can either be a scripture or a spoken word when God is telling you something about your life. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. I'm going to give you this. So God can give you a word in your heart, a promise he's making to you, a vision that he's giving you. And then that's a word from God. You can take it. And then you can also take the written word. But faith begins, the God kind of faith begins with a word from God. And so you have to have a word from God in order to have the God kind of faith. All right. Now, what's exciting is that the God kind of faith is creative power. It creates what it's believing. It's not just wishful thinking. It's creative and it was in Hebrews 11.3, we know that by faith, the, the worlds were framed by the word of God. God created the heavens and the earth by his word, filled with his faith. And it's creative power. Whatever God says actually comes to pass, because even if it didn't exist it before, it does now. As soon as God, you know, that's another reason why God can't lie. Because everything he says happens he said it it's done that's why he can't lie because it comes to pass as soon as he says it so the exciting thing is that the creative the god kind of faith is creative power but the natural kind of faith has no power it is powerless so that people who only use natural faith they are powerless They can do nothing to change their circumstances. And that's why there's scripture in Psalms became very interesting to me one time when it says, I forgot what chapter, but the wicked are like the beasts that perish. And I thought about that. You know what? Beasts have animals have no ability to change their circumstances. In other words, they are always the victim of the circumstance. If it, if it rains, if it hails, if it, there's famine, if there's disease, if their home blows down, they can do nothing to change their circumstances. Well, the wicked are like the beasts. The natural faith is just like beasts. They have no power. It's powerless to do anything. And so when you're operating in the God kind of faith, You are no longer powerless. You have the power to create what you're believing. It is creative power to create what you are believing to come to pass. And so as you keep believing it, it is in the works of creating. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we use the God kind of faith, We are using creative power to create what we're believing. 
So with that understanding now, the difference between natural faith and the God kind of faith. Now go back to what this person said to me. I'm waiting for the manifestation. Well, what are they? They're waiting to believe they're healed until they see and feel healed. Well, guess what? What kind of faith is that? That's natural faith, believing what you see and feel. So that person, and you see that language has has even snuck into the faith teachings where people are trying to believe and use faith and they say, I believe I'm healed, but I'm waiting for the manifestation. And that's a trap. Because what you've done is you have just fallen into natural faith. You're waiting to see it and feel it. And another thing people do is I'm waiting for the doctor's report. Why do you need the doctor's report? You have another report. And if you're waiting for a doctor's report to tell you you're healed, then you're in natural faith and there's no power. You've got to wait. You have to use the God kind of faith that this. And the thing is, the Bible trumps any word of the doctor. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible trumps. So it doesn't matter what the doctor's report is. Why are you? I'm waiting to get the doctor's report back. I hope it's good. Why are you waiting for that to believe? That's natural faith. And now you're depending on a doctor to tell you you're healed. That's natural faith and there's no power in it. It's powerless. But if you will take the word of God and believe that, I don't need to wait for a doctor's report. I already have God's report and the Bible trumps every other report that doesn't agree with it. And then if you do get a doctor's report that's negative, you can go put your Bible on top of that doctor's report and says, now this scripture trumps that doctor's report. And the scripture is creative power. And the scripture will turn any natural thing around. Hallelujah. So the scripture is more powerful. It is eternal. It is creative. Let me bring you, though, a trick question. And I've asked this before, so you might remember the answer. Is the Bible powerless? Hmm? Yes, it is. If you don't believe it. How many people in the world have heard a scripture and they're not saved? Probably most people in America anyway have heard a scripture verse, but they're not saved. It didn't change them. It didn't save them because they didn't believe it. Oh, I don't believe that garbage. It is powerless if you don't believe it. But believing it is like striking the match to the fuse. It's dynamite. I mean, how many people have a book, a Bible on their bookshelf and they never open it? They, I mean, all in there with a hundred other books, there's a Bible stuck in there. And you can say, does that Bible bringing fruit in their life? If it just stays on the bookshelf with in between all their old Westerns and all that other stuff on the bookshelf, is it bringing fruit? No. It's powerless. Exactly. It's like a box of dynamite that the fuse never gets lit. It can sit in storage for a hundred years and never explode. But you pull it out, you read it and say, I believe you just struck a match to the fuse. (laughs) Now it's explosive power. Amen. 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 So everybody say, I believe believe. the word of God. I believe I am healed. I believe I am rich. You know, many times people say, uh, you know, well, when are you going to believe you're rich? Well, when I see the money. (laughs) Well, that's natural faith. You got to believe you're rich when you have no money. You believe you're righteous when you just messed up and fell on your face. When you just did a big no-no, 
I'm righteous. Thank you, Lord. I believe I receive my washing in the blood. I'm the righteousness of God. You know, you believe you're healed when you're sick. You believe you're rich when you've got no money. But why do you believe? Because God said it. And because God is trustworthy. Because his word is true. And he is faithful to his word. And if we would just believe it, it becomes explosive, creative power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So again, it's not just the hearers. It's not just those who have a Bible. It's not just those who go to a church service. But then you have to say, I believe it. And then you do it and you act on it. You put it to practice in your life. Amen. So, you know, this title, what are you waiting for? Came when someone said to me, they kind of got into that trap. I'm healed. I'm just waiting for the manifestation. And after I didn't say anything on the phone, but after I got off the phone, the Holy Spirit starts telling me what's wrong with that. You know, that's wrong because that's the same as the unbeliever. That's the same as the sinner. They're waiting for the manifestation too. To before they will believe they're healed. They're waiting to feel healed. They're waiting to look healed. We've got to be different than that. And the God kind of faith believes you are healed when you don't look at or feel it. And, and, and the Lord um, brought this scripture to my remembrance in Romans 8.24. It's actually about hope, but it's the same thing regarding faith. Romans eight twenty four says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all, who hopes for what he already has. Now, I'm going to change that because it applies the same for faith. So I'm going to change the word faith put in the word faith for hope because it's the same principle for in this faith we were saved but faith that is seen is not faith at all for who has faith or believes for what he already has for ex- for example do i have to stand here and say i believe i have shoes on my feet i believe i have what white sandals do i have to use faith for that No, because they're on my feet. Who has, who needs faith for what you already have? So I'm not up here believing God. I have white sandals. I believe I have white sandals. You don't use faith for something you've already got, something you're wearing. That's already done. The point is you don't need faith for what you've already got. You need faith for what you don't have. That's what faith is for. Not what for, for what you do have. So what good does it do to believe after you have it? You don't need to believe after you have it. No need to believe anymore after you got it. Then you can go believe for something else. I mean, once you have it, you're, you're done believing. You've got it. Now you've got to believe for something else that you don't have so the whole purpose for faith is for what you don't have you get it and so we're not believing i'll believe when i see it well when you see it you don't need to have faith anymore you see that so we are using faith when we don't see it but we're believing with the god kind of faith so we can have creative power to bring it To bring it to manifestation. Amen. So, hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. So we're not looking at the things that are seen. Those things are already manifested. So we're not looking at what's already manifested. We're looking at the things yet that are not manifested and believing that we have them and we fix our eyes of faith on it. And that's it. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then something else that the Lord has been speaking to me about faith is with hope. And we understand And if you haven't understood this before, hope, Bible hope, is confident expectation. Because 
the, we can't use hope the way the world uses the word hope because they use hope like wish, desire, want. Are you, are you going to get that pay raise? I sure hope so. Well, that's a desire. I sure desire that. I would like it. I want it. I really, really, really want it. I hope I get it. And it's a wishful thinking. It's dreaming. But that's not what Bible hope is. That's not what it is at all in the Bible. In the Bible, it is a confident expectation it, that you are expecting it so much you know it's company. It's coming. Amen. You know, and it's looking with outstretched neck because you know it's just going to come right around the corner any moment. It's like when you're, when you tell your kids that grandma and grandpa are coming over and it's Christmas and they're going to be bringing a load of presents. Now the kids keep running to the front door, the front window, watching for grandma and grandpa because they're going to come up with this big load of presents. Now the kids are looking out the window like that. Now that's expectation. They're believing that they're, that grandma and grandpa are coming because mama and daddy said so. So it's based on the truthfulness of mom and dad's word. If you can have confidence in the person who said it, you can believe it's coming. And so we have confidence in God who said his word who speaks his word. And that's why we expect, because God said it. That means it's on the way. And then that expectation is looking for it. It's always expecting, expecting it's going to come. And like every day you go to the mailbox and it's going to be in the box today. It's going to be in the box today. It's going to be in the box today. That check is going to be in the box today. And I mean, we've all had the, those moments of going to the mailbox, expecting something in the mailbox. And that's the confident expectation. That's what Bible hope is. Now, if you're going, I really don't know if I'm going to get anything. I wonder, nope, I didn't think there would be anything anyway. You know, then that's, that's not confident expectation. Now, when you talk about people in healing lines, I want to uh, bring up a story. Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth E. Hagen, he's in heaven now. And one of my spiritual fathers, I went to Rama Bible College, and he ministered healing for nearly 70 years. It was 69 plus years when he went to heaven that he had been in the ministry. And he was raised from the deathbed at the age of 16. He had actually died four times. And then uh, God healed him and raised him from the deathbed. He was healed on believing Mark 11, 22 through 24. And he went then for the rest of his life preaching faith and healing and how to receive. So he had a ministry of healing and he had lots of prayer lines. And so his experience, he'd see people coming in the prayer lines and he'd see those that did get healed and those that did not get healed. And, you know, on the radio right now, I'm talking about that. You know, why do some people not get healed? There are reasons and it's not God. It's not God's fault, but there are human reasons. And one of those is he would see people and he could tell many times when the power flew, uh, flowed from his hands. He knew when he laid hand, because the Lord told him he'd have the healing anointing in his hands, that when he touched people, he felt that power go from him. He could also tell when it went into the person or when it kind of hit a brick wall and it didn't enter the person. And that means anointing can be flowing toward a person and they not get it. Because he could tell when it was regarding them would be their their unbelief or something along that line, he could tell it's like it was like laying hands on a brick wall and he felt the power leave him, but he felt it not absorbed, not received. So there can be healing power flowing and still somebody didn't get it, but he can also tell when he puts his hand on somebody and it went in and he could tell they took it and they received it. They absorbed it. And that person goes away shouting, hallelujah, I'm healed. And one of the things he pointed out, noticing 
is many times or sometimes that when he put his hand on the person and it didn't go into them, the power didn't go into them, he would overhear them later saying, well, I didn't expect anything. Well, that's why. Where was your expectation? You didn't expect anything. And it's like, I didn't think I would get anything anyway. I've been in so many prayer lines, I never get anything. Like, Well, if you say so, you have what you say, if you say so. And yet, and so there were people that he would help them to receive healing. And they were sincere. They weren't in that kind of of an unbelieving attitude. But he, in his earlier years, he would do healing meetings for two or three weeks at a time, four weeks, whatever. But he was there for plenty of days, teaching and laying hands every night. And he would see some people come in sometimes and they'd get in the prayer line on Monday night and they didn't get healed. And they'd get in the prayer line Tuesday night and they didn't get healed. So then, and this is when there were smaller groups so that he could actually spend time counseling and advising people one-on-one. I mean, you can't do that when you have a lot of people. But he would tell them sometimes, I want you to go home and for the, don't get in the prayer line for the next three days. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wait until Saturday before you get in the prayer line. Come back to every service. But between now and Saturday, you say all day, the next time he touches me, I'll be healed. The next time he touches me, I'll be healed. The next time he touches me, I'll be healed. The next time he touches me, I'll be healed. You say that all day long for three days. And on the fourth day, you come get in the line. And you know what? Every time they got it. Because for three days they had built expectation. You need expectation. And I heard Billy Burke say, now he's also was on Sid Roth. You can get it on YouTube. If you watch YouTube and pull up Billy Burke, Sid Roth. And he was on the program once and told his own healing. He um, received healing under Catherine Kuhlman. He was nine years old and was dying of brain cancer. Was was it cancer, tumor, or both? I guess the same. Cancer. And he was nine years old. And the doctors gave him three days to live. I mean, he was dying at nine years old. And actually, it was um, five days. His grandmother was a follower and a listener to of Catherine Kuhlman and they lived in Pennsylvania and that's where her ministry was in the seventies. And so his, um, grandmother was listening to Catherine Kuhlman, watching Catherine Kuhlman. So he, she got permission to take her grandson home from the hospital because he, the doctor said he's going to die in just a few days. She took him home and she kept leaning down in his ear and, and whispering for the next week, five days, I think, when she touches you, you'll be healed. When she touches you, you'll be healed. When she touches you, you'll be healed. And she just kept speaking that into his ear. I mean, I mean, he had a patch over an eye, his whole head bandage. No, he's in bad shape. But she would lean over and speak in his ear. When she touches you, you'll be healed. And she said it again and again for five days. And then the Catherine Kuhlman meeting came. And they were up in the balcony. And Catherine Kuhlman pointed, said, come down here. Funny thing, he, I guess he was shy. He said, no. <laughs> he says, come down here. He says, no. And then she said, ushers, bring him down here. And so the ushers grabbed him and brought him down on the platform. But guess what? When she touched him, boom, he was down. And when he stood up, he was healed. But he, she said he, she, there was a comment of the faith that he had. Well, why? The expectation he had, because his grandmother had been telling you, well, when she touches you, you'll be healed. So he had the faith to receive or the expectation to receive. Now I want us to read Mark chapter 5 and the woman with the issue of blood. Seventy-four. 
74 was when he was healed. And then Catherine told him that you're going to have a ministry like mine. She actually um, prophesied that he would have a healing ministry. And that's why he does now miracles like Catherine Kuhlman. And he flows in the spirit kind of like Catherine Kuhlman, but not quite the same. Mark, Mark 5 and... Starting in verse 24, when Jesus went with Jairus, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she, what? She heard, so you can underline the word heard, about Jesus, she came, you can underline the word came, up behind him in the crowd and touched, you can underline the word touched, his cloak. Now verse 28, depending on your translation, the actual translation, the King James says, she said, but the Greek is a continuous action verb, and so if you look at it in the Amplified or the Weiss translation, It actually says she kept saying. She kept saying. Now think about that. For she kept saying. If I only touch his clothes, what? I will be healed. Now she kept saying it and she kept saying it and she kept saying it. What was she doing? Building expectation that and you could almost say when I touch his clothes, because she was determined. She not. I mean, it says if, but she was pressing. She was determined. She was pushing. And so when I touch him, I will be healed. Now she kept saying it. What if she hadn't kept saying it? She probably wouldn't be in the Bible. She probably would not have received. And so Excuse me. The Lord put it in my heart like this. It's just like Kenneth Hagin told people, when you go home for the next three days, say, and keep saying, and keep saying, the next time he lays hands on me, I'll be healed. The next time he lays hands on me, I'll be healed. Why? Build expectation. And that's what, um, Billy Burke's grandmother was con- kept saying in his ear for five days, when she touches you, when she touches you, you'll be healed. When she touches you. And so the expectation, when she touches me. And now this woman in Mark 5, that's exactly what she did. She kept saying, if I only touch his clothes, I will be healed. She kept saying it and kept saying it. So she's building expectation. Now notice there is then a point in time, maybe you can call it a demarcation line, a point in time when you say, at this point, I take it, I have it, it's mine. We need a point of reference to say, at this point, at this moment, I have it. And and this is something that, most people don't do. You have to prepare your faith to believe to receive. Don't jump in and pray and claim something if you haven't built your expectation for it yet. Because you often do not receive unless you have prepared yourself to expect to receive. And so prepare, prepare your faith to receive. So that means you might need to spend time studying and meditating scriptures on your need, whether it's healing or finances, for a few days. And then you can plan, okay, now on Thursday, I'm going to receive. And set a point. At that point, I receive it. And then you are building your expectation, meditating on it, and now on Thursday, I'm going to get it. I'm going to have it. And you've set your demarcation line. That's when I take it. That's when it's mine. Because then you reach that point and then, okay, you reach that point and you don't yet have the manifestation. Well, that's the point when you believe you did receive. So then you go past that date. And if you're still waiting, you just say, I did receive. 
I received it on June, on July 29th. It was mine, and I'm healed from July 29th on. And that is creative power because now that believing what you don't see is now creating what you don't see. So don't quit because you don't see it. You keep believing it and calling it done because while you're believing it and calling it done, it's creating what you don't see. It's creating. We are not fixing our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen. And you've got to know what's unseen is, is enormous. Things are being created that you don't see yet, but keep believing it because it's happening. It's, co- it's being created right now when you release your faith. So when we need to remember these points. One thing is you need to build expectation to receive and also have a demarcation line or a point of time when you take it. And when you look at the Greek word translated receive, for example, in Mark eleven twenty four, whatsoever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That word receive, everywhere in the New Testament, it's the same Greek word, lambano. And guess what lambano means? It means to take possession of. <clears throat> to take, to possess, to grasp, and to seize. Let's do that little example with the Bible. I want you, one of the points I've taught on the radio about not why some people don't receive is passiveness. Passiveness, not being aggressive to take because this is the attitude. Come closer, please, this way. I can't reach that far. This is receive. I have my hands open, palms up, and she places the Bible in my hand. Did I do anything? No. 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 Am I active? No. 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 I'm very inactive. I'm standing here, palms up. She is doing all the work, putting the Bible in my hands. Now, that's the way most Christians are. They're just waiting. Come on, God. Come on. I'm waiting, God. When, God? When will you heal me? When will you do this? When will you do that? Come on, God. And they live their whole life waiting. I wrote down a quote, wait a second, that Billy Burke said, I love it. The waiting line usually never manifests. Because he talked about those who are waiting in line. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. They never, they usually never get. They usually never manifest. It's the believing line that manifests. And people who are just waiting, come on God, they're not active. Passiveness is a big reason why people don't receive. Now, this is the actual receiving, and it means to take, and it means to grasp with the hand. Now, have I done something? Yes. 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 Am I active? Yes. Yes. I have reached out my arms, wrapped my fingers around the Bible, grasped the Bible, and pulled the Bible toward myself. Now that's take. So in English, take is active, receive is passive or inactive. And we have to be careful because where the word receive is in the New Testament, it's not the inactive word that we use in English today. I'm just receiving this whenever you just drop by and, you know, drop it on me. That word should be have been better translated take because it is active. Thank you, Laura. So you can see there is the action of taking. I reach out my hands. I grasp the Bible with my finger, clasp my fingers on it and pull the Bible toward myself. That is taking. That is active. And that is the Greek word lambano. So every time you see the word receive in the New Testament, it should have been take. And it means actively taking. And you could even write that in there. Whatever you believe you actively take, you shall have. 
It's an action word, not an passive, inactive word. And so Billy Burke, because I mentioned that and you'll see it. He said it in the conference. But people would come up in line to get prayed for, and he sometimes would never get to that line because the spirit moved in so many different directions and, and calling out words of knowledge. And, and like one woman, and this is, I just was watching it a few days ago again. She said, I was in the line that never got prayed for. <laughs> and she said, but I received my healing. And he stepped by and stepped by, stepped back and said to the people, he said, you know, the waiting line often never manifests a healing because they're just waiting passively, inactive. You need to get aggressive and take your healing. So whatever you are asking for, whatever you are believing for, you take it with faith. And so then that's why it's good to have a point of time, a reference point saying at this point of time, I take it and I have it and it's mine. And from that point, then you call it done. You call it a finished work, even if you don't see it. Yep. And so... The woman with the issue of blood kept saying, and there's the part of building expectation. When he touches me, I'll be healed. When she lays hands on me, I'll be healed. When I touch him, I'll be healed at that point and kept saying and kept saying and kept saying, and she acted on it. So she got up. There was the action. She had to leave her home, press through the crowd. All of it, which would have been difficult physically. She was tired, weak with loss of blood. And also, besides that, it was Jewish law that a woman in her condition shouldn't be in public, you know, unclean. And so that she was doing all. And there's Jairus, the synagogue ruler right next to Jesus could have scared her off. I mean, there's synagogue ruler right there. And I'm going to go get and he knows who I am. I mean, this is not a big city here. And she kept pressing through and acted and got up. And what happened? Verse 29, she received healing. She felt in her body. She was healed. So you see, this is the, the faith. And so then what do you do at that point? If that day comes and you haven't yet seen, well, faith calls things that are not as though they were Romans four seventeen, And so you call it done. From that point on, you call it a done work, a finished work. That was the point I received. Now it's finished. I've got it. And you might not be able to tell other people who, who don't understand faith. Then you, you, you cannot. The problem is, is when you talk to people who don't have faith and who don't understand faith, how do you speak to them? Well, the best thing is to not speak to them. <laughs> Because you don't want to lie. But you need to say something like, well, I believe I receive. I believe I'm healed. And just try to keep the conversation short if they can't understand. Because you don't want to be saying, I'm waiting for it. I don't have it yet. Because you believe it's a done, finished work. And so best to say as little as possible to those unbelievers. And so, but around and in your home, when you're by yourself, say it continually. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Thank you, Lord. That, and that gets me to the next point. Okay. Faith calls things that are not as though they were. So faith calls it done. A finished work. The healing is finished. The need is met. The bill is paid. So if you're believing God to pay off a debt, it's done. That debt's paid, paid in full. It's paid. Glory to God. Prayed, paid in full, Father. And that takes me to the next point. Faith gives thanks. Faith gives thanks. One of the most powerful releases of faith is giving thanks. Giving thanks and praise to God for the done deal, for the work finished, is one of your greatest releases of your faith praise the lord it's done thank you father that debt is paid thank you lord i am healed praise and thanks draws more power and that's where we were at the end of our praise and worship service and we were just i mean just in my heart thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord and then the lord reminded me in that atmosphere that's where more miracles happen 
in the atmosphere of thanks, miracles start happening like popcorn. And, and so giving thanks and praise draws more. Giving praise for what he's done draws more power, brings more manifestation. So the more you praise him, the more power. The more you praise him, the more miracle. The more you praise him, the more provision. So thanks and praise draws more power. And it is one of the greatest releases of your faith, thanking him that it's done. Hallelujah. So you thank God for what you're believing for. Before you see it. And Hebrews 12, 28 says, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, we're receiving healing. Let us be thankful. We are receiving finances. Let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Be thankful because you know that God's power is working and you can see it in your eyes. For example, what we said um, that faith sees the things that are unseen. Well, how do you see it? With the eyes of your heart, with the vision in your heart. So you've got to get that vision inside of you to be bigger than what you're seeing with your physical eyes. You got to change the vision on the inside. If the vision on the inside is you're sick, you're in debt, you're broke, you're a failure. You got to change that inside vision. That's what's ruining you is what you're seeing in your heart. You got to see in your heart. You got the job. See yourself in the job. See yourself in the healing. See yourself in the finances and build that inner vision. And what you see on the inside becomes greater than what you're seeing on the outside. And you're giving thanks to God for it. And you're praising God and you're shouting hallelujah. Even before anything has happened, that is releasing the creative power. And there's creative power working. That is the creative power of God. It is creating and producing that thing that you are believing. That's where the power is. Hallelujah. If you are over in the natural faith waiting to see it, then you're, you're powerless and you'll be the victim and you won't get manifestation. But you're over here on the creative side by believing God's promises and praising him for it and calling Calling it done. Now it's working. It's creating. And you will see it pretty soon. Because it, you see it in your heart already finished. And you call it already finished. Amen? Amen. Glory. Hallelujah, Father. We praise you. Oh, Lord, we praise you and thank you for what you've done. Lord, that's the way you work. You looked at the darkness and said, light be. You looked at the earth and the universe. You created these things out of by and and by faith and by the power of words. And Lord, we thank you for teaching us. These are your principles. These are the way you operate. And thank you for teaching us how to do what you do so we can create things in our lives the way you create. We give you thanks and glory and praise, Father, for it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God.